So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, event. And uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Alessandro Massi Pavan, and I'm the coordinator of the Interdepartmental Center for Energy, Environment, uh, and the Transportation Giacomo Ciamician, which is uh, organizing, I promise you, this amazing event. And uh, um, I would like to extend my welcome to everybody and thank you very much for being with us today. Now I, we will move and uh, have the uh, addresses of uh, the authorities. And we will start with uh, the uh, deputy rector of the University of Trieste, Professor Walter Sergo. Please, Walter. <clears throat> I'll have to apologize, actually, with our uh, speaker of the day if I'll start the presentation in Italian. Uh, the reason is sort of official. Uh, oggi è la giornata delle università svelate. È un'iniziativa alla quale prende parte l'Università di Trieste e come tale abbiamo ricevuto un messaggio dal Presidente della Repubblica Sergio Mattarella con preghiera di leggerlo a tutti gli eventi pubblici che dovessero svolgersi oggi nelle università di Trieste. E da questo mi accingo. Rivolgo il più caloroso saluto a tutti i partecipanti all'evento Università Svelate, che si svolge per celebrare la prima giornata nazionale delle università, istituita dalla Conferenza dei Rettori delle Università Italiane. Svelare le università significa mettere in rilievo il ruolo cruciale svolto dagli Atenei nella formazione culturale dei giovani e, dunque, nello sviluppo della Repubblica. Significa rafforzare le connessioni tra centri di cultura e ricerca e comunità, contribuendo alla diffusione della conoscenza, alla partecipazione alla vita pubblica, al consolidamento della coesione sociale. Significa saper guardare al futuro. La promozione dello sviluppo della cultura e della ricerca scientifica, principio fondamentale sancito dalla Costituzione, trova nella preziosa attività degli Atenei un propulsore privilegiato per la crescita del capitale umano, vera forza del Paese. Oggi, aprendo al pubblico le strutture, i complessi monumentali e museali in cui hanno sede, le università colgono l'occasione di mostrare la loro missione, incrementando la loro stessa identità. A tutti gli Atenei va l'apprezzamento per la loro attività e l'auspicio che continuino ad essere, come lo sono stati nei secoli, fattore di coesione e innovazione. Il Presidente della Repubblica, Sergio Mattarella. Uh, we can revert to English now uh, to say that this event uh, belongs also to the celebration for the 100th year of the University of Trieste. And thus, uh, it is a very, very high honor to have such a world-class speaker speaking today about uh, uh, a dramatic issue as energy is. Uh, you will hear more about the speaker later on, and before giving the stage back uh, to Professor Massi Pavan, I'd like to stress uh, that uh, the event uh, is uh, in memory of the Emeritus Rector of the University of Trieste, Professor Maurizio Fermeglia. Mau, for those who knew him well, uh, has been uh, really a driving energy for this place, for this institution. Uh, very suddenly, unexpectedly, he passed away a few weeks ago, and uh, till his very, literally, till his very last day, he spent uh, all his efforts working uh, in research, and uh, probably even more important, in spending uh, a lot of time in uh, increasing the public awareness uh, on issue of the energy. 
So I like to ask you an applause uh, on memory of uh, Professor Maurizio Fermeglia. Mau. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you very much for your <clears throat> warm hello to also Maurizio. And now I will leave the floor to uh, Elena Caprotti, who is uh, um, the director of the Energy Transition Service of the region Friuli Venezia Giulia. Please, Elena. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Let me extend uh, the warmest uh, greetings uh, of uh, the president of the region, Massimiliano Fedriga, and uh, the environmental counselor, uh, Fabio Scocimaro, to everyone here. In the wake of uh, extreme weather events and the urgency of climate change, energy transition has become a key priority to address the challenges of a current climate crisis. And the autonomous region Friuli Venezia Giulia is working hard to achieve a just energy transition. In this regard, I would like to highlight that we are arranging the new regional energy plan to meet the targets set by European Green Deal and Repower EU. The Regional Energy Plan is a strategic tool designed to pave the way to an inclusive energy transition. And its main goals will be to maximize energy security and energy self-production, along with scaling up renewable energy supplies and green hydrogen. However, the Regional Energy Plan is just a part of uh, the border regional effort to achieve energy transition in our territory. The approval of the regional law FU Green last year reflects the administration determination to act, setting out our goal of decarbonization in the regional territory by 2045, five years before the European objective. I am confident uh, that our effort will contribute to create a more resilient society and uh, ensure a sustainable future for our territory. And we are strongly determined to deliver an effective transformation that leaves no one behind. Thank you. So, uh, as the coordinator of the center of the Giacomo Chamichan Center, which is organizing this event, uh, I can say that we are really honored to have uh, Professor Kamen here as our esteemed guest, all the way from the University of Berkeley in the United States. Professor Sergo already said that this event is dedicated to a great friend a very valuable colleague, uh, an esteemed scientist, the former rector of the University of Trieste, Professor Maurizio Fermeglia, who passed away suddenly, unexpectedly, and sadly three weeks ago. And we wanted to dedicate this uh, event to him because uh, it was under his leadership as a rector that the Giacomo Chamichan Center was funded few years ago, and the name of the center, Giacomo Chamichan, was chosen because Giacomo Chamichan was his hero, as he was always used to say. This event and the work of uh, 
Professor Kamen are perfectly in line with uh, the work and the mission of Maurizio Fermeglia and the mission of our center, which is to tackle three of the main, most urgent and interconnected challenges that we face as a society nowadays. And these are energy, environment, and uh, transportation. And the way we do it is uh, the same in a, with a, a multidisciplinary approach. In fact, here at the Giacomo Chamichan Center at the University of Trieste, we work on different fields related to the, these three pillars, which are related with engineering, with uh, economics, with uh, social, physical, chemical sciences, biology, and medicine, and even more others. And uh, since a long time, Professor Kamen is uh, showing us this, uh, this way. And uh, in fact, his research focused not only in the science, but also in the policy of uh, decarbonized energy systems on the social aspect and on the environmental justice. And uh, before moving on, we have now other two, uh, uh, two colleagues that are giving their uh, addresses to this event in, uh, because they are uh, co-organizing the event with the Giacomo Chamichan Center. The first one is uh, um, Professor uh, Fantoni, who is the president of the Fondazione Internazionale per il Progresso e la Libertà delle Scienze e fondatore del Laboratory for Quantitative Sustainability. Professor Fantoni, please. Say good evening to everybody. Uh, it is really a privilege for me as uh, the president of the Trieste Foundation, Trieste International Foundation, <clears throat> and also personally, I tell you, uh, to be here uh, in this memorable day and also sad at the same time because uh, of what is representing. Uh, you can, uh, it's now better, okay. And uh, so uh, just to say a few words about uh, uh, the laboratory that uh, have been uh, starting uh, now about a couple of years ago and uh, have the uh, and I have to say that I'm um, glad to say that uh, the government has um, uh, just uh, confirmed the, uh, the fundings for this laboratory for, uh, uh, for three more years and so we, we can work now uh, as, as we, we wished. Uh, the, <clears throat> the laboratory wants to, uh, to, to consider the main issues of sustainability from the qu a quantitative point of view uh, the most scientific as it can be. Uh, we don't know yet uh, how that it can be. It's a complex, it's a complex system as, as we know. And, uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I will learn and we will learn of the laboratory uh, a lot from your lecture magistralis. And I'm very glad and privileged, as I said, to be here and listen to you. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Professor Vanni Lughi, who is the president of the College of Fonda. College of Fonda is co-organizing this uh, event. And, but before doing this, please let me particularly really thank uh, l'amico, the friend Vanni Lughi, because for, we, for his determination and uh, engagement, we, we can today have such a great uh, uh, guest. So thank you really very much, Vanni. And uh, this is the last time I speak today. So thank you for being with us again to everybody. And uh, really enjoy the event. And Daniel, really thank you again. Vanni. So thank you uh, again. There's a lot of thank yous today. Um, I'm here uh, with uh, two roles. And the first one is just uh, um, as a president of the Collegio Fonda, as uh, Professor Massipavan has said. Well, Collegio Fonda is a, a college of merit that uh, gathers uh, uh, very good students from the University of Trieste. 
And today is actually one of the events uh, that the Collegio Fonda, alongside with the Fondazione uh, Casa di Risparmio Trieste, organizes to uh, bring uh, science, knowledge, uh, in the city to our community. Uh, so we normally organize things for our students, for the students of the Collegio, but every once in a while, uh, we open these events uh, to all the, the population, all the citizens, and this is uh, uh, what, what's happening today. So I'm not going to say any, anything uh, else about the Collegio. Uh, these are the three uh, institutions that co-organize this event. And so now we are done, we can finally enter uh, the core of uh, what's happening today. And uh, of course, the core core will be uh, the talk by Daniel Kamen, but um, usually before the Lexio Magistralis, we give an introduction, and today the introduction should have been uh, made by Maurizio Fermeglia. And clearly that's not gonna happen, so you're gonna have me, I'm sorry. Maurizio should have been uh, right here in this spot, instead of me. Uh, that's uh, how Alessandro and I had planned it. Uh, he would have been the perfect person to deliver this introduction um, because Maurizio had been working on the transition uh, for the longest time, uh, way before it was called the transition. He was a visionary and so he saw this coming and he started working decades ago. Uh, he uh, used to warn colleagues, friends, the general public about the risks of climate change, uh, what can we do about climate change. Um, and he was definitely not only a very recognized researcher, but especially a very uh, recognized, appreciated communicator. This is why he should have been here. There's another reason. He had a very good sense of justice, uh, how this transition should be just. And so, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, once again, uh, he would have been perfect. But it's already been said, so I'm not going to say that again. He passed away uh, suddenly in Valrosandra, very close by, the place he loved. So what I'll try to do is to convey the concepts that I'm sure he would have conveyed uh, through his eyes, through his even through his slides. Sorry, Maurizio, I cannot ask for permission here, uh, but I'm sure that you would give that permission to me. Um, I'm gonna use his slides, his uh, eyes, to introduce these uh, very basic concepts that I hope will, be, uh, will set the stage for your talk. But before we go there, um, I wanna say a few words about uh, the man. Um, Sorry, I had to, I, I normally don't read, but uh, here I have to. There's many reasons for that, and I'm sure you understand those. Maurizio was a full professor of chemical engineering principles here at the University of Trieste in the Department of Engineering and Architecture, and of course, former rector of our university. He is universally remembered as an exceptionally versatile individual who excelled and left a very significant mark in any, uh, not only in the academic environment, but in any endeavor uh, he ventured into. Uh, mountaineering, for example, civic engagement, uh, among many others. He graduated in chemical engineering, in the, at, right here, in 1979, then he moved to uh, Denmark, he came back uh, as a researcher, then became uh, associate professor in 1992, and then full professor in 20. Uh, he served as a rector from uh, 2013 to 2019, and then he covered uh, many, many managerial uh, positions here at the university, as well as at the national level. Too many to mention. And also, I want to be quick, so I'm going to cut some stuff. Um, he had a very um, active and prolific scientific activity more than 250 papers published in uh, international journals, over 200 presentations at international conferences, conferences and institutions, including dozens of invited plenary uh, and keynote talks. He managed many uh, international projects, 
uh, at the European level, at the national level, um, mainly on initially on theoretical aspects of chemical engineering and process engineering, nanomaterials. He also delved into database and computer network studies. Uh, but in the last two decades, he strongly contributed to the development of multi-scale molecular modeling through his work and vision and ideas. In recent years, he focused on life cycle assessment using also multi-scale modeling as well and introducing several innovative ideas. His entire scientific career, however, has been inspired by and dedicated to sustainability. So everything was really uh, matched with this idea. It was the background idea of everything he did. Particular focus he gave on uh, sustainability of processes and systems in the context of the energy transition. So once again, you understand why he should have been here. He conducted research, of course, but he was also a, consulted for, a consultant for United Nations agencies like uh, the UNIDO and UNEP. Maurizio was a passionate and highly esteemed teacher in uh, various chemical engineering courses, and he has contributed to the education of several and thankful uh, generation of, of professionals. I know that some of these are here in this room. Um, as I mentioned, he also engaged in extensive and very much appreciated scientific communication and outreach activities, primarily in the field of sustainability, with dozens and dozens of talks, seminars, and conferences. Alessandro and I shared many of those with him. Dedicated typically to the general public, but not always, and uh, they were always characterized by originality, vision, and a lot of passion, at times too much passion. Uh, he got angry at people many times. And that's, you know, got people angry at him too. In, among these uh, outreach activities, in 2010, he founded the Summer School on Energy. So now let me uh, pull out a quick uh, couple of slides uh, so I can help my talk with those. Let's see. If they work. Okay, I don't know how to do that. Well, we'll do without the slides. He founded the, um, the School on Energy in 2010, which was later dedicated to, once again, his hero, Giacomo Chamichan. Um, so who, who was Giacomo Chamichan? Just a quick note. Giacomo Chamichan is a, a person who at some point in life, said the following words. Let me read that, that for you because you can see. If our black and nervous civilization based on coal shall be followed by a quieter civilization based on the utilization of solar energy, that will not be harmful to progress and to human happiness. So this is something that an, a modern environmentalist could say. And instead it was said in 1912 by this chemist from Trieste, uh, who is nowadays considered one of the fathers of the renewable energy, the solar energy. So we have this honor, and this is why uh, he was the, his hero. And this is why we named uh, the center and the school after Giacomo Chamich. Anyway, on these topics, Maurizio Fermeglia was uh, very active on other fronts, like including the civic engagement, also as uh, with, with his role as a delegate, the regional delegate of the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, driven, the, so his driving force was always the idea of using his academic skills, his academic knowledge for the community's benefit. Um, in general, in, communica in communication, in education, and in research, Maurizio has always advocated for the importance of an interdisciplinary approach to education as the only way to tackle the challenges that humanity is facing. So one might ask which are these challenges, and now I see the presentation miraculously. So this is um, the title of one of his uh, uh, presentations at the school, and you can see the title. A sustainable future is based on E3, energy, environment, and employment. So you can see here, 
you know, uh, some of the pillars of what he saw as sustainability. So this is one of the, the key messages. And, you know, employment means essentially attention to the social part of sustainability, which is often neglected. And I think he was a visionary about this too. He was uh, an advocate on explaining what sustainability is, and you know, there are always at least three pillars, the social, environmental, and economic aspects of sustainability. I'm gonna go very quickly here. I just wanna show you uh, some of his slides to convey his points. He was very worried about, and I think he's right, about the growth of population. This is one of the global challenges that we face nowadays, and that sustainability itself faces. Um, he was uh, uh, very keen on bringing along the message that John Beddington, uh, back in the days, uh, uh, started saying. He was warning us, careful guys, we're facing a perfect storm. In every talk by Maurizio, you would see this slide. He was really obsessed by this, and I think rightly, rightfully so, because we are facing very quickly uh, a shortage in water, energy, food, and things are going to go downhill unless we do something. And I, today I really want to give a positive message. So um, he was an advocate of uh, bringing along the message of global warming, showing the data against all the deniers. And he was, of course, very worried about um, global warming because it melts glaciers. And he was a great skier, so he hated snow going away. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I really wanna uh, be quick. He was an advocate of quantitative sustainability, making sure that we can measure things and say if something is more or less sustainable than others. So he was bringing along uh, the concept, various concepts of uh, indicators, quantitative and measurable uh, indicators for sustainability. And then he saw, you know, the advent of artificial intelligence. He uh, was able to think about that and reflect on how this would impact our society and, of course, the role in sustainability and how industry is changing how industry is changing in terms of putting the people and the sustainability back at the center. Not, you know, you know digitalization is fine, uh, you know, digital twins, blah, blah, blah. That's everything is great. But we make industry for people and we do not have to harm the planet. So back to industry, what people call industry 5.0, he was bringing along this uh, uh, new message as well. Maurizio passed away while hiking on a trail in the Val Rosandra. For him, being native of Trieste, La Valle, the valley, was the home mountain. And the mountains uh, have been one of his greatest passions. In fact, the uh, spirit and the discipline associated with mountain activities often permeated his academic life. He did everything like he was in the mountains somehow. Uh, a great alpinist and ski mountaineer, member of the Alpine Club in Italy, but especially of the elite part of the Alpine Club, the, the Il CAI, la, Il Club degli Accademici. He had been an instructor in these disciplines and had participated in various mountaineering expeditions, including several outside Europe. For example, he was one of the first Europeans to explore the way of climbing in uh, uh, Yosemite Valley in California 40 years ago, uh, where he climbed, for example, the iconic Half Dome back in the days, uh, along with many other uh, things. He's been the station leader of the Alpine Rescue Service, once again demonstrating with his acts his desire to put his skills and knowledge at the service of others. And I, as a mountaineer, particularly appreciate this commitment. So, this sense of knowledgeable civic engagement is one of the most important lessons that I think Maurizio Fermeglia has left to us. Maurizio leaves behind a profound void in his family and friends and in his, in, in his many communities. 
the one of the civil engagement at the university, the community of mountain lovers, for example. Yet, I think that his legacy more than fills the void he is leaving behind. Um, and I think that this legacy will endure time. Time. Time is one other key message that he brought along. Uh, we have no time. This is the last slide of him that I'm going to show. The time for action is now. We have to act now. There is no more time for inaction. There is no more time to turn away from problems. And it's this that I want to leave you with, a citation of the immortal Pink Floyd, whom Maurizio loved so much. No more turning away from the coldness inside, just a world that we all must share, a world that we all must share. It's not enough just to stand and stare. And then a question, is it only a dream that there'll be no more turning away? And to answer this question, I think um, I'm going to answer directly to Maurizio. I don't think that it's only a dream, Maurizio. I think that all the people here today, this uh, full room, really is testifying that we can do this, that we all, if inspired by people like you or like Daniel Kamen here, who strongly believe in this much needed change, we all can really act and make it happen. We can power a just transition. Thank you. Now, I'm sorry for you guys, but two, two more minutes with me. I'm going to have to uh, present our speaker, finally. Um, Daniel Kamen is the James and Catherine Law Distinguished Professor of Sustainability at the University of California, Berkeley, with parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group, the Goldman School of Public Policy, and the Department of Nuclear Ener Engineering. His work is focused on decarbonization, energy access, and climate justice. He's, he has served as senior advisor for energy and innovation at the US Agency for International Development. He is a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And he is the co-chair of the UC Berkeley Roundtable on Climate and Environmental Justice. He was educated in physics at Cornell, Harvard, and held postdoctoral positions at the Caltech and Harvard as well. Before moving to uh, UC Berkeley, he was an assistant professor and also chair of the science, technology, and environmental policy program at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He was appointed the first Environment and Climate Partnership for the Americas Fellow by Secretary of State, by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in April 2010, and served as Science Envoy for, for Secretary of State John Kerry from 2016 to 2017. His research is focused on the science and policy of decarbonizing energy systems, energy access, and environmental, and environmental justice. He's published more than 450 papers and leads the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Lab at Berkeley. His research is currently focused on decarbonization of power systems around the world, energy access and social justice, material science for low carbon econ economies, big data approaches to clean transportation, and on the electrification of health facilities across Africa. Daniel Kamen, has uh, founded or is on the board of over 10 companies and has served the state of California and the US federal government in expert and advisory capacities. Then Kamen was the first chief technical specialist for renewable energy and energy efficiency at the World Bank, has served as contributing and coordinating lead author on various reports of the IPCC since 1999 IPCC, which in uh, 2007 shared the Nobel Prize for Peace. 
Then Cameron serves uh, on the advisory committee for energy and environment for the XPRIZE Foundation. He's on the board of Native Renew Renewables, the Empala Research Center, the Chabot Space and Science Center, the Human Needs Project, Kibera Town Center in Nairobi, Kenya. And then lately, uh, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So without further ado, <laughs> I'm very honored to introduce to you, Daniel Kamen. It's not reading. <laughs> In the old days, it used to be the, the actual slides, and then it was the transparencies, and we still have challenges. So thank you so much for, for fixing them. So again, it's really my honor to be here. I know we're starting a bit late. I'm really honored and saddened to be here um, after the passing of such a great leader in this area. But I hope the comments I will make show how this really is a partnership in many universities, research groups, governments, and others all working together on this topic. And what I'll try to illustrate today will be some of the ways in which there is good messages, there's good hope for those that are willing to put the work in on this topic. So my own laboratory, the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory, you can find all of the materials I'll talk about today. For those who use social media, even though the founder, or not the founder, maybe has gone insane, it's not clear. Um, but on Twitter or X, um, that's also where we post some of the uh, comments on our work. And I'm particularly blessed to be working on these topics at University of California, Berkeley, which has a history of activism, a history of, of protests and links, and maybe if I only illustrate just a few of the people, all of whom spent serious time at Berkeley. Um, some of you have seen the Oppenheimer movie that just won award after award. Um, he was the chair of the physics department. Um, but below him, you see President Obama with Arthur Rosenfeld, who's considered the father of energy efficiency, the first great lever in switching from a energy inefficient fossil-based economy to a clean energy economy was the work that Art Rosenfeld started. Art Rosenfeld was Enrico Fermi's last graduate student. He left University of Chicago with Enrico Fermi, went to the Manhattan Project, came to Berkeley, and here he is receiving the National Medal of Freedom from uh, President Obama. Um, some of the people I've had the chance to work with, Mary Nichols, our champion of climate in California. You can see some of the governors, Robert Bullard in the top right, leader on energy justice, um, Wangari Mathai, who I'll bring up in a bit, and actually we have in, our, in the audience Nancy Chege from the United Nations Development Program, who was um, on uh, the, the, the core staff, the, the senior assistant to Wangari Mathai, um, Nobel laureate, champion of, of ecofeminism and justice, um, someone I had the chance to, uh, to meet with as well, and then many of the other leaders, all who've spent time at Berkeley in this fight. And it's really in that tradition that I get to talk with you today. So my first few slides will be depressing, but it's not, it's not a depression that you don't already know. It's that we are way behind. That doesn't come as a surprise to anyone working in the field. It should come as a particular point of annoyance and anger to the young, because we've known now for decades that we are way behind. And even the current best policies, the EU 2030 plan, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, the Energy Transition Fund in China, all would only put us in the top light blue band. Stabilizing, if you can call it that, warming at roughly three degrees Celsius. If we look at all the pledges, all of the words, maybe we get down to only warming the planet by two degrees. 
But we know from the science, and there is no left and right science, no red and blue science, no liberal conservative science anymore, that we need to limit our warming not just to zero emissions, but we must go carbon negative. That means we must shift entirely how we think about our economic systems. I'm a physicist by training, and when I got into this field, the challenges were seen by us with our blinders to the science as mainly focused on better solar cells, better wind turbines, is natural gas, and by the way, I will call it fossil gas, not natural gas, is fossil gas a transition fuel or not? All of those questions were based in the STEM fields where I come from. To get to the lowest paths here and to get carbon negative, we have to hand off the reins or we have to partner with the social sciences, humanities, business worlds, fields that didn't feel initially part of the story. We can make fancy, complex plots like this all day long. My laboratory spends a lot of time plotting out what would it take to remove the black there, the fossil fuel emissions, to lift up the amount of green energy, to conserve land, to make this curve bend down. Everyone working in this field has made these kinds of graphs. It's not that I don't think they're useful. It's that I hope this talk will do the next step for some of you. And that is we must move from PowerPoint to power plant. And it's critical that we find the ways that we can, yes, do these graphs, but move much more quickly into a world where we're thinking hard about what it takes to not only reduce emissions, that actually turns out to be relatively easy. We might not want to. We've put a number of major barriers in our way. But even if we transition our energy mix, but don't transition our institutions, our respect for women and men equally, minority groups of all different types, socioeconomic, racial, and others, that we don't get there. And while I don't think that the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 different goals set up by the United Nations, 194 subcategories, tells the whole story, it's a major intellectual and theoretical step forward. And so what I'll try to illustrate in my comments today will be just some of the examples and ways that we can make the energy transition really about the just transition. And unfortunately, just like the climate goals, we're way behind. I stole this slide from my colleague Nancy Chege at United Nations Development Program. It lists where we are on the UNDP goals. And as an academic, even an academic who unfortunately practices grade inflation, that means if the students work hard, I give them maybe better grades than their numbers should be. But even with great inflation, I would have to give us a F or a D, the worst two grades, because we are only making minimal progress on these goals. The climate crisis is upon us right now. We see it on the fires that you see in the hills in uh, late summer, in the fires that we have in California, in the fires that consumed something like two trillion animals in Australia, and every time we open the news, we see a version like this. 2021, 2022 was a record-breaking year for bad news. That bad news is only half the story. And I said I would depress you in the beginning and hopefully change things as we go forward. We also know that there is no climate solution if there isn't a justice solution meaning an equity solution. And there is no equity if that's not part of the justice story. The richest 10% of the planet consume over half the world's resources. The poorest half of the planet consume less than 7% of the planet's resources. That's, again, easy to say, but the question is, how do we change the story so we do something about it? And again, that's what I hope is the main message you'll get in the talk. When I travel, almost everyone says we're tired of hearing about California. 
you think you're so great, and then you look on the news and you see that there's high crime in certain areas, and there's parts of the state that want to leave California and become the small republic of Donald Trump and all kinds of things. So we have a much to atone for in California. But like Europe, we have a very good climate plan. And the pieces of the plan that get attention in the US are the same pieces of the climate plan that get attention here. Those graphs I just showed you and said shouldn't be as important as they are. In California, we said we would meet 20% of, of our energy demands with clean energy by 2010. We missed that target. We only achieved that 20% in 2013. But by 2020, we had exceeded our target of 33%. So we jumped dramatically last decade. Our target for 2030 is to be 60% powered by renewable energy. And we count solar, wind, geothermal, biomass energy if it's sustainable. And we do not count nuclear. And we do not count large hydro. So we have a very strict definition of green. California now routinely operates at 70 to 80 percent. This week, California was at 110 percent. We have seen across the U.S. renewable energy power plants opening, coal plants, fossil plants closing. If we jump to the global scale, you can see solar in orange, wind in green, We've been building those and we're closing on the global scale fossil plants. Some people view nuclear as part of the solution. I am a professor of nuclear engineering, but I have mixed feelings on nuclear. And large hydro in much of the world is a challenge because it is low cost energy, but it comes with tremendous ecological damage. Again, I mentioned here in California, we are now routinely running at 100, 110% clean energy. We export clean energy to our neighbors. My own rooftop in California, here you see it on a nice spring day in June. Clear sky, lots of solar. But we also have these days that look like the world of Mad Max, the climate apocalypse days with the dark skies, as you've seen in the news and you've seen here, when the output of my own solar panels go from here 1,500 watts down to zero. So the climate change is not only terrible for us all, but it makes this transition more difficult. Many of the reasons why we need to move to these, these climate targets are highlighted in the pictures of good days and bad days. And the day of uh, May 7th, 2023, in New York City looked about the same as that movie Blade Runner in terms of what the sky looks like. In terms of the damage to ecosystems and species, the two degree target that we used to have is not sufficient. The one degree target is better, but we know we will all be facing significant climate change even in that world. So we face a huge number of challenges. For us in California, we have set these targets for clean energy. We have, like in Europe, said that after 2035, the sale of new gas powered vehicles will be ended. The United Kingdom has already said, oh, 2035 is too far. I agree with them. 2030, Massachusetts in the US has set 2030. We in California are fighting now for 2028 because we don't want to be left behind elsewhere. So we are seeing these changes. All of these features are important, but I actually think in the end, the feature of our own climate law that we'll be most proud of are not these graphs and these targets for number of electric vehicles, um, that amount of renewable energy. It's that our climate law is the first one that included a explicit financial commitment to justice. When we passed our climate law, we said that 35% of all the revenues from cap and trade, our carbon management scheme, must go to poor and underserved and marginalized communities. And that 35% is a floor, not a ceiling. Then Vice President and candidate for President Biden said, that's a good rule. 
I'll do you 5% better. And so President Biden passed Justice 40, a requirement that 40% of all federal monies get spent on clean energy. Now, for the engineers in the room, this slide is old, old hat. And we all have a feeling for Moore's Law, the law that every 18 months, your cell phone will not only get cheaper, but unfortunately, it will stop working because we plan in a level of obsolescence. The reason your cell phone gets cheaper, though, is that every 18 months or so, we double the number of chips, the number of processors per area on the chip. And that's called the learning curve. It's part technology, part business and operations. Economists don't think it's a basic law of economics, but it's arguably the basic law of energy and other transitions. When we think about going from an old style phonograph, that now my, my daughter says, oh, these are back in fashion, dad. You don't put it off on the left because now kids want these again. We went through the CD and the disc to the mini disc phase. All of these are transitions to technologies that are at least in some sense superior. Not in every sense, but what this means is that we can make the hardware better. And so the detailed, complicated picture, this is showing the maximum efficiency of solar cells. This is a graph only a material scientist could love. This shows the maximum efficiency of different types of solar cells, the crystalline blue ones, the emerging ones in red, the quantum dots, the perovskites. There's a lot of detail buried in this graph of improving technology. Don't look at this graph. That's the same graph for batteries that are getting better just the same way. Look at this graph. What this shows is the price of solar back to 1978. On the vertical axis is price. On the horizontal axis is not time. Time is just a stamp along the curve. Along the horizontal axis, that's the total amount of solar cells that have been deployed. Not just manufactured and left in a warehouse, but actually deployed in the field. To an engineer, this is a beautiful graph. This is called a power law which means that the improvement is taking place at a rate equal to the slope of that line. What we see for solar is what we see for electric vehicles, for batteries, for wind turbines, and that is every time we double the amount of the technology we sell, we see the slope of that line, in this case about 20% drop in price. This is really the fundamental law, the fundamental theory of innovation and learning. It just says the cost at one future time, cost at time two, compared to cost at times one, is just a power law relation to the volume of sales. It's a very beautiful relation. It leads to us thinking the more we find ways to get technology in the field, the more we can find ways to make it cheaper. In fact, in my lab, one of our projects is to say, well, that's too simple. We really want to know what role for research and development, what role for other things. So we've done a lot of work to take that simple equation and add a term that reflects the amount of research. After all, what professor doesn't want to be able to say that research shows up as a point of driving the cost down? In fact, we see this. The more we can quantify and measure and invest in research, the more we can make technologies cheaper. This is back in regular space, price against time, the cost of wind, onshore and offshore, solar, batteries, all going down in cost. That's great. That means we need to build more and deploy more of those technologies. There's just two little problems, and neither one is little. The first is that I have not yet given any feel for how social and gender justice fits into this equation. This is a hardware story so far. I could get this same curve by only selling expensive Teslas and Rivians and Pritzkers to the richest people in the world, and the price would come down, and the technology would get better, but we wouldn't find a way to really deploy this 
so that everyone has access to the technology, not just the rich. The other one is part of the story where myself, as an old physicist, needs partners in business, in social institutions, with the, with the Greta Thunbergs, the Vanessa Nkates, the youth, the climate rebellion, because the other part of the story is that we have institutionalized climate disasters. Today, 2024, the total global investment in renewable clean energy is about a half a trillion dollars. The total subsidy, not the value, just the subsidy worldwide for fossil fuels is somewhere between five and eight trillion dollars a year. So just the subsidy for the fossil economy is massively larger than what we're investing in renewables. So part of the story is a financial one where people not in the energy field will play the critical role. The other part is justice, and I want to talk a little bit about the justice piece because just like um, uh, your departed professor, one of the critical issues is that we're able to quantify the cost of energy, the cost of pollution, but we are not well equipped because we only just started to quantify the social benefits and the inequality in our society today. So I want to show this graph, which has a famous name in the US. It's called the duck curve. So this is supposed to look like the back of a duck. 10 years ago, Utility executives around the world, I met with them in California, I met with them in Argentina, in England, in Germany, they said this curve will be the end of renewable energy. Why? This is the demand for energy during one day, this is for California, and it shows that in the middle of the night, over here on the left, the demand was energy was for flat. Old people like me were asleep, Students were doing whatever they were doing. I don't want to know. But during the day, the more renewable energy, mainly solar, that we installed, it's good that we reduce the overall demand. You can see the demand going down year after year. But as the demand goes down, then the value of adding more solar goes down. And then you have a problem at the end of the day. At the end of the day, when our schools and businesses are still open, and people go home, and the demand rises because both are on. We have this electrical engineering problem here called the ramp rate. We have a huge increase in demand right as the sun is setting. And since solar looks like it will be the largest part, maybe wind, but solar has some advantages, the challenge was how do you find value for clean energy when at its peak, its value looks like it's going to zero? We in California now have negative prices for energy during the day, meaning you, will, you have to pay to take it away because there is so much renewable energy in the system. A number of, of scholars and people in industry looked at this curve and said, why are these utility executives so afraid of this duck curve? In fact, this curve is our friend because what this says is that instead of saying everyone with an electric vehicle or with industry needs to find a way to use power only in the middle of the day, this is the perfect time to charge up our electric vehicles, to power up batteries for electric airplanes, for industry. And so now we have this new situation where the same utility executives around the world were saying duck curve will be the end of clean energy are now rushing to find good ways to use it and to store it. The story of hydrogen maybe will become one of those areas. Green hydrogen is hydrogen made from clean energy. Maybe that's a place to store it, but maybe these fleets of electric vehicles charged up in the middle of the day, most cars are used extensively in the morning and extensively in the evening. There are, some exam there are some exceptions, I'll talk about taxis in a bit. But the opportunity to charge up 
and power our mobility with green energy means all of this low-cost renewables is a huge benefit. So again, an, a financial story that the energy community did not appreciate at the time. So today, this is just a few days ago, we have very low prices for energy in the West Coast. There is no cost for energy in Texas because there's so much solar and wind. And there's small cost in the East Coast. So we have free power in some states and negative priced power in other parts. And that's not because of good planning by utilities. That's because renewable energy has now become the cheapest form. In fact, today, it is now cheaper to build a new renewable energy power plant than it is to simply operate an existing fossil plant. So what I do in my laboratory is build models of the grid for the electrical engineers. They're called capacity expansion models. We look at what the price of energy is if we add a transmission line or add a new storage facility or plan on fires in August bringing down the lines. And what we see here is all that extra green energy goes into batteries and then comes back out when the demand is high and the price is high. So this new world is one that renewable energy brought us at the surprise of most utility executives. It's essentially shifting that low cost green energy to these peak times of day. So it's a great step forward. The challenge is how do we take this and make it not just a story about innovation to make green energy more common, but how do we make the story about equity and justice? So let me broaden out and I'll use the rest of my, my time and comments to, to highlight that. This is an example of one of those efforts. The city of Shenzhen in southern China, just outside Guangzhou, just outside Hong Kong, decided that they would replace every single gas-powered taxi they had and do it in one year. That's the Chinese way of doing it. They also, uh, Shenzhen wanted to do this because uh, the, one of the largest uh, Chinese uh, electric vehicle companies, BYD, which stands for Build Your Dreams, is based there. So all of these are BYD taxis. And what happened in Shenzhen was they built the world's largest charging station, 600 places for taxis. When you have 31,000 electric taxis, you need even more than that. But what they found almost right away is that without smart logistics, BYD as a rich company did well, the city did well, taxi drivers did very poorly. The taxi drivers had to wait for hours in line to recharge their vehicles. So what does any smart student like in your college here do? You, that is you build an app. And so what our students did was to build an app, you can see it over here, and it couldn't be simpler. It tracks the number of charging stations that are open. Oh, did I see? And it says, if you arrive in the next five minutes or 32 minutes from now, there will be a charging station available for you. And the driver gets more points if they arrive on time, and they get a penalty in points if they arrive late. And just like frequent flyer miles and bonus shopping cards, the drivers really like to compete to get the highest score. What we found after one week was that the waiting time at charging stations went from one hour to nine minutes. And it was just because people like to compete in these social science games. As a physicist, I know about game theory and Nash equilibrium from my math background, but I know nothing about behavioral psychology. This is an area where the energy community desperately needed advice from people that designed these games. And we were too slow to reach out. There are the taxi drivers getting their taxis. You might notice there's a bit of a gender issue with taxi drivers in Shenzhen. But the system now works to benefit drivers. Their wait times have dropped 9 to 12 minutes. Their revenues have gone up. It's an example of this broader investment getting us to a clean energy future. As we think about this clean energy revolution to come, it's not only, of course, 
about finding tools to make the story more equitable. It's about understanding that there are choices that we might make just because they're easy and in front of us that have huge racial and gender and environmental impacts. And the one that's getting the news right now is in all of our cell phones and our laptops, there is almost certainly, there might be some really clever engineer here who went for a very new one, but in mine, unfortunately, there is cobalt. And that cobalt is almost certainly mined in the Congo. And it's mined in many cases in mines like this. Unsafe, illegal, child labor, and the numbers are dramatic. You can see here the expected rise in the amount of lithium by mid-century is 1,000%. The amount of cobalt, almost 600%. These are huge numbers. And when you first look at them, it looks like we're trading the problems of the hydrocarbon economy, pollution at the power point and at the point of use, for a materials world where our materials injustice is just as large. And that doesn't have to be the case. This is one of the areas where my world, physics and material science, needs desperately to engage much more broadly with people that think about the justice aspects of not just energy, but mining and land use and human rights abuses. And so here is an example. Today, the, the vast majority of electric vehicles, as well as, again, our batteries and our cell phones and laptops, involve cobalt. It didn't take a lot of work, just a few years, to recognize that there is an alternate material, not cobalt, that produces a battery that is basically the same, slightly different charging range, and that's lithium using phosphate, not lithium ion as, as the battery compound. First Tesla and then VW said they would switch entirely to lithium phosphate batteries. Lithium that looked rare, this graph was made before massive lithium discoveries were made. Phosphate is very common. And so the ability to switch out from cobalt to phosphate is one example of choosing to make a choice for a greener material. Now, this is not a simple story. Let me just give you two opposing pieces of it. On the one hand, a company that I won't mention, BMW, decided that they would do a very careful life cycle analysis and they would only source sustainable materials. At the time, they've, cho they've changed their, their decision since then, but at the time, they said they would stick with lithium ion, but they would get their cobalt not from the Congo, but from Morocco and from uh, Madagascar. And that was good for the company, but it went, what it meant for a poor, war-torn country, the Congo, was that their investment left. So the real question is how do we invest in areas that need it, but make that investment into the just transition? Well, now we have examples of companies moving back into places that are challenging politically, but going after materials that themselves are more sustainable. We only have a few examples today, but they're growing. That's the type of partnership that results in justice. And I mentioned lithium. Ten years ago, everyone working on material science thought lithium is our bottleneck. It all, the, the quote was, it all comes from China and Bolivia and from Chile. We are now just trading in the OPEC nations for these new lithium, not true. It is now cheaper to extract lithium directly from seawater than it is to mine it anywhere. That's a science innovation, came from KAUST, the, uh, the MIT or the NTNU of Saudi Arabia, but we can now extract from seawater. And the companies that have been launched are just starting, but they're indeed finding this is true. It's an example of investing in justice. I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, and it is also an interesting but complicated aspect and you know it's complicated because uh, 
the President uh, Macron of France, two weeks after it was passed, came to the United States to complain about it, that the U.S. was now stealing all the best new companies from the EU. I'm not sure I believe that, but it just got through. It invested enough money in clean energy that it will double the rate of decarbonization in the United States. It will triple the amount of solar, double the amount of batteries, and it comes with a complicated story, not so different than the EU 2030 plan. And that is, our plan is problematically protectionist against China. It comes with strong incentives not to utilize solar panels and other materials from China and to build supply chains in places that politically we've decided are, 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 are more palatable. What we're seeing are stories with that sort of complication. Yes, it's a green energy transition, but to get it through, there's a mixture of protectionism and investing in local companies. Some of that may be valuable, but we also have to recognize that we have to dramatically accelerate the rate of this, of this effort. I'm going to close with one more example because it highlights how we how, at least for me, I have learned from colleagues to think quite differently about the cost declines of clean energy in terms of justice. So this is a story about my other large piece of research on energy access. Roughly 700 million people on the planet don't have access to electricity, and well over a billion don't have affordable electricity, reliable, and if you get to affordable, it's maybe even two billion, so a huge number. So one of the sustainable development goals that I mentioned in the beginning, SDG 7, is to bring universal energy access by 2030. There are many ways to do it. You could extend the grid, you could build mini grids. So the area that I was uh, able to work on when I was at USAID was a partnership with Nancy Chege, who is here from the United Nations Development Program in, Ni in Nairobi. This is an effort at the UNDP, the Global Environment Facility, uh, and she is the uh, manager of the Small Grants Program in Kenya to give monies directly to community groups working at the interface of conservation and local development. And the project that was developed was one that leverages everything I've described to you in the talk so far. This effort is called HEDA, Health, Electrification, and Telecommunications Alliance. I think the easier term is powering health, but HEDA is the term because I learned in government that we need acronyms. And the idea of HEDA is that there's about 170,000 health facilities in Africa, from the smallest clinics to the largest hospitals, and you see them all with the blue dots or light green, uh, depending what you're, what you're uh, depending how colorblind or not you are. But the black lines are where the grid is in Africa today. So the question is, can we leverage clean energy to power these health clinics, not just to meet the needs of the equipment, but also to become hubs of their own small utilities? Here are some of the examples of boilers at hospitals on the left, and on the right is an example of a joint Italian-US company. This is called Off-Grid Box. They make a mini-grid in a box, solar panels on the top, charge controllers, inverters, Wi-Fi generators, water pure, all in the container. You take them out, the, the container becomes the office, the panels are on top. They're small systems. And we've deployed about 200 of these in Rwanda and the Congo. And then here we have larger scale systems. This is a health clinic in Eswatini. You can see not only the solar, but also the IT. That's the T and the HEDA. And the effort here is a very large partnership that's grown over the last three years. And you can see the UN agencies. You can see major foundations. You can see some of these vaccine groups like Gavi that are instrumental in bringing COVID vaccines, energy companies, UN agencies, and large corporations all working together with university groups like my own laboratory here, partners at ASU, Oxford recently joined, um, a number of groups 
to leverage clean energy, again, to overbuild energy projects for health. So this is an effort of from planning to building these mini grid systems to empowering and enabling healthcare workers. So far, this program has deployed over 1,700 of these systems. Our goal for 2025 was to build 10,000 of the 100,000 we need. We are already well on the way to that goal, so the new goal is 25,000 powered health clinics, a quarter of the way there by the end of next year. And this effort is a challenge of logistics and funding and efforts going forward. But in fact, we got a real boost from these conversations. So my laboratory was responsible for developing very low cost devices that we plug in so we can monitor the voltage and the frequency. And so we know, is this refrigerator in this clinic in the Congo running properly? And only if it is, will the company that did the installation get paid? So this is an effort to utilize information technology to enable reporting and the, and the delivery of resources. And here we have the examples for the electrical engineers. Here's the voltage at one of these facilities. You can see it's all over the place. This burns out baby warmers. This burns out oxygen generators. Um, it is uh, the up and down of an unreliable diesel system. A large solar system was installed, and you can see the voltage is very smooth. I won't go into the details because it's late, and only an electrical engineer or a power systems person would love it, but it's an example of the superior power quality that we can get in these systems. That, however, is not enough. In the discussions we've had with, um, with Ms. Chegi's organization, UNDP in Nairobi, we got a very clear message back that no one is going to say they're not in favor of this HEDA. Who wouldn't want to have renewable energy powered systems at your small clinics to your large hospitals? But if that's all you do, you will contribute to an environmental injustice. You will contribute to the poorest members of the community that currently rely on traditional ethnomedicine, traditional healers, herbalists, they will be driven out when you do all this high-tech stuff. So this is um, uh, Ms. Chege here meeting with one of the uh, managers at a environmental justice organization. In the middle, this is a, a leader of a young mother's group in northern Kenya, an ethnic minority tribe. And this is a sales office for these ethnomedical compounds. Um, and so what they asked is, you're gonna bring in better refrigerators, other equipment, find a way to integrate in traditional medicine into the community. So here is an example of a meeting, a traditional, um, this, is a, this is actually a midwife receiving a certificate for her, her assistance um, in providing, uh, providing care, uh, both during delivery and with some of these traditional medicines. This is a traditional medicine um, this is a gentleman who identifies and finds compounds to be brought back and made into materials um, for ethnomedical efforts. And so what we are right now trying to do is to marry together the technology-based effort around these health clinics that are, again, not only powering the conventional or Western medicine components, but also finding the ways to integrate in this ethnomedical uh, features by using the refrigerators not only for conventional medicine but also to preserve compounds, using these mini grid locations as places for community gatherings, for teachings, and it's again an effort to try to build and marry together the parts of a clean energy transition and a community empowering effort. And so I, I close with this example because it's an example of an area where we on, and myself on the energy side have been very blind for a long time. Too excited about the technological parts that we need, but not finding ways to invest in these efforts that put resources back into the communities. So uh, Nancy Chuck, if I ask you to stand for a second. This is the manager of the program in Kenya who has put together the community outreach parts of this. So thank you so much for what you're doing.
So I know we've gone long. I hope I illustrated both the ways that we are looking for avenues to integrate in justice, not as something we sprinkle on, but something we bake in to how we think about energy systems, but also how we design new energy systems that have justice as a core component. So thank you all for the chance to speak, and I really appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you so much. Is it open? No, it's open. Um, my name is Robi Danielis. I've been given the task of uh, coordinating the Q&A &A section, question and answer section. So uh, I think we have a microphone here. So if uh, anybody, yeah, okay, there is already a question, so it's going to be quite easy. Not yet. Can you, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this um, extremely insightful um, reflection, set of reflections that you gave us. Um, in particular, uh, my name is Max Pauli from the World Academy of Sciences. Um, in particular, I want to link to one last point you made in your reflection. You used the, the term blind, and I found that very um, insightful, as I said before, because I think we, most of us are energy blind, um, in, in our lives, especially because we're lucky, we've been brought up uh, in an environment highly technological where we just uh, switch, we just press uh, switch and so on. But this has implications in the way we behave and decide our actions. In the context of justice that you, you, you highlighted to us, uh, in, uh, I think how uh, people in other countries cannot do what we do. Mm. So how do you think it's possible to change this energy inertia of blindness of our societies which are economically and politically obsessed with consumerism and growth? Like in, in, in 1972, there was a paper that it was entitled Limits to Growth. Yeah. And yes, 50 years later, it seems that we are still completely uh, oblivious to those limits. Um, so uh, our politicians struggle, but even common people, because I think the audience here is probably a tiny fraction of the, the, the population that should be uh, enlightened. So is there a, a physical um, way that you think we could suggest to to society to, to change the, the, the way in which we consume energy uh, to be more just and, and, and therefore more of a human being in line with, with those in other countries. Whew. Boy, so th this is not a question, this is a course. I think this is a, a brilliant question. Um, I, I, obviously there's no single solution. Uh, one of the companies that I founded almost 10 years ago was so embarrassingly simple. What we did initially was we, we printed out for each part of, the, a part of the US, and then we did it in Scandinavia, just a little paper tag that you put over the light switch. And it just showed you how much is coal, how much is fossil gas, how much is renewable. So when you flip this switch, what are you doing? And of course, my student said, DK, please, this is really 1930s stuff. Now we have an app. And so what you do with the app is you go around wherever you are, hold it near the, it shows you what's the mix where you are, not just on average, but like the duck curve. If you're using power at 2 p.m. in the afternoon in an area with lots of solar, it shows it's all solar. But in the exact same location, in the middle of the night, it might be, coal, it might be fossil gas. So my students said, we can do better than your little paper sticky by the light switch. Now we go around with the app. And so that's one example of at least letting people know. But I think the bigger part of your story is one that my community really has little answers for. The economics community is grappling with this idea of degrowth. Can we be happier with less? 
And specifically, can we be happier with less if we're not already the 1%, the tenth of a percent? Because it's easy to say, I'll have less if I already have far more than I need. The question is, how can we build energy systems and technologies so that we actually have a higher quality of life, but we're consuming less? So one of the examples, and again, there's no single answer to your question, one of the things that I think is very exciting is this new idea that comes from the climate youth of, democ of democratizing energy. And that is, if you buy your energy from some big uh, conglomerate, maybe it's green, maybe it's not, but if you're, bill if you're buying locally generated solar from the roof of your local store or on the roof of a school, you can get a real quality content label. So ultimately, one of the questions here is will we be powered, in 2050, will we be powered by a very large grid, large corporations, large amounts of energy transmitted long distances, or will energy become more local and more of a commodity? We now know with the price of solar and wind that essentially any building, two square meter roof to any size, could generate power and sell to its neighbors. The technology to sell that power is all in here. You, could, you can have an entire utility managed through your phone. So one of the areas is can we be a society where we sell energy to each other and price is one metric, but so is justice. If my solar panels are made with materials that are high in conflict, could I receive a lower price than if your solar cells are organic or whatever else? And that's this whole new field of the social cost of carbon. So I don't think there's any single answer, but there are tools evolving. I wish they had been evolving 20 years ago, but these are some of the ways that we can think about making that question real, making that democratic clean energy a local. So sorry it's such a long answer, but that question has so many interesting elements. Thank you. Over there. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. It's not easy to end this kind of talk uh, with an inspiring note, and you did. Um, my name is Katia Rivera. I'm a PhD student here in circular economy. And in a way, you already answered my question because uh, I wanted to ask about the growth. Very often when we are talking about this transition, um, we don't want to face the reality that we cannot just transition into a new source of power. We also have to change our consumption habits. And in my experience, this kind of question makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to ask you, how can we bring the growth into the transition mm. debate? into the transition speech, especially when we are talking to politicians, uh, policymakers, to not make them scared <laughs> and, you know, to actually be able to make some progress. Thank you. So part of your question is much too deep for me because I am not an expert on degrowth. There's arguments and analysis about how we can build our, you know, the things in our society that allow us to be happier with less material things. Use materials, recycling. And in fact, one of the big answers to this issue is about cobalt and magnesium and all is the massive amounts that we waste because we have so many things that are one-time use. How do we value those more than just what we call in the US, do you use it here, tipping fee? So in the US, we use tipping fee to say, the price for, 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 I want someone to take away my garbage. But I don't care that some of it's cobalt and tungsten and plastic, I just want it gone. We don't value those materials, so we decide we have to go mine more materials. And while we have tools of life cycle analysis, we have not been very thoughtful about recycling. I have one example that I think is interesting for this. That is when you buy a laptop or a cell phone in California, there's a small fee 
It has not affected sales at all. It's about $19 for an iPhone and about $31 per laptop. That's what the state estimates the cost to do recycling of the critical materials there is. And the company has to show they recycle that amount. Now, the footnote is that they don't have to recycle the actual atoms in my phone. They just have to say if they used 46 tons of magnesium, that they recycled that much. So it's not perfect yet, but it's at least trying to start to do full cycle analysis. And I think that's one of the answers to your question, because there is a huge business in doing that that companies don't do today. And so if we want to make this less scary to politicians, which is not a small job, one of the things is to say we think there is big businesses not yet launched in this area. The other one that is popular is that we now know very clearly for every euro or RMB or dollar invested in renewable energy or energy efficiency, there's two to three times more jobs than in fossil energy. Now, that's not because renewables are better, that's just because the field is new. And when you're doing a new field, there's more jobs, and of course there's no fuel cost. So you're investing in companies and people and training. So I think there are some of the tools there to make the case, but we're at a very low level in finding these opportunities. And I think this is again an area where if you look to the physicists, you'll be looking for a long time. If you look to people who think more broadly about marketing and business opportunities and cradle to grave cycles, you'll start to make more progress. So I fear the answer to your question is that I am looking to you on this topic because this is one that my, my community of physicists are working on some parts, but they are not good at what you asked. Please, there is a question here. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for an uh, insightful, as my colleague said, an inspiring uh, presentation. So I actually have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time <laughs> and of not wanting to be lynched, um, I think I'll stick to the most pressing one. Mm. So um, let's say that the world runs on about 15 terawatt of power. Down in California, you guys are doing quite well although I would question the 100, 110% because yes, you're transitioning to electrical vehicles, but a lot of your cars still run on, on gas. So that 100% doesn't take account, into account. That's right, uh, that's, that's 110% electricity. You're absolutely right. We still right. have, right. It's, we, st we still have, you know, a two family house has three cars in California. It's right. true. But, but that's fine. Most, most uh, sort of claims go with those percentages and I can live with that. Anyway, so we need to, on a worldwide scale, that 15 terawatt, well, 80% of it comes from fossil fuels. So we need to build, literally, the infrastructure for mm -hmm. renewables because it's not there. Yep. And we need to build it urgently for Africa, South America, large, par par large parts of Central Asia, where I would estimate more than one billion don't have electricity. But anyway. Um, so when you build infrastructure, of course, you need uh, money raw materials, skilled labor, lots of space because renewables have a low energy density, uh, time because they don't build overnight, and energy. Mm -hmm. And right now, most of that energy will come from fossil fuels. So how do we build all that infrastructure for renewables without <laughs> creating massive carbon emissions? Yep. yep, so it's a great question, and it's at the forefront of what we need to do. In 2023, 2022, and 2021, more than 70% of all new energy projects were renewable worldwide. That's remarkable, but you're right. It pales in comparison to the amount we must add, and if we power the renewable energy transition with fossil energy, are we really just extending the life? So we now have, in California, they now have in Sweden, 
they are discussing it right now um, in Costa Rica, clean energy content requirements in the industrial sector. Not just we need to build this much, but we have to power industry. Ten years ago, we called industry the difficult to decarbonize sector for obvious reason. So the question is, can this next wave of building be one that is in, pack, in part based on green energy? Sweden and California and South Korea have now opened the first zero carbon uh, cement factories using renewable energy to make Portland cement. So there are examples of it out there, but there are few. And if all we do now is build more renewables without this social transition, then we essentially build a nice green skin around a black ball of energy. And that challenge is one that I don't think we have the tools yet, but they are under discussion. So one example of what you said is absolutely right. We will need infrastructure, transmission, and other projects. But one of the options that we're seeing is increasingly possible is that the amount of large-scale transmission we need to bring large amounts of Norwegian green energy to Europe, to bring green energy to the west coast of the US, to bring green energy from China's inland where the sun and wind is plenty to the coast is big transmission. It's also the case that we can build much more decentralized energy than we thought before. These mini grids are no longer a few kilowatts. And you mentioned the 15 terawatt, the world budget today. It'll be 45 to 50 terawatts in mid-century. But we are now seeing more and more places saying, I think we can set up the rules so that energy is sold locally, not globally, and we generate much more near and on site. The build out of offshore wind, which is now going strong in Europe and going strong in China and just getting launched in the US, just getting launched in South Korea, is an example of taking advantage of a new clean energy resource near many of the world's big cities where we don't need that level of transmission. Building communities that generate their own power. In France and in um, California, they're called eco-blocks where the solar on the rooftop is not owned by the individual. It's a shared communal resource. There's a shared battery. So there are examples, but the, there, is no single, there is no single example of putting this together yet, and you're right. Our industrial policies are not green as of yet. So this is, this is part of the challenge uh, to, uh, for, us to, for us to do going forward. So, great question. Um, I th do you mind if we take other questions? Want to, but okay. yeah. uh, are there any other questions from the floor? Right there. Back there. Oh, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, you told us a lot about uh, our um, ratings, about uh, degrees uh, that we are going to achieve, that we need to achieve. But uh, I wanted to know why we cannot achieve it yet. Or if it's uh, your sphere of expertise, maybe what technologies we lack to achieve the planned um, hmm. temperature reduction. Okay. So I want to make sure I get the question right. So two different parts. Part of it is, is, bare, is bedded in the question that came from over here. And that is, I would say we do have the technologies to build clean energy systems. We have examples. Coast, Costa Rica has run for 109 days straight only on renewable energy. California will, will certainly achieve this target. I'd like to think Europe will achieve the 2045 goal. Um, so I think that technology is not the barrier. There's no question we need to make the technologies more efficient, more just. We need to build them with clean energy, as the question over here came from. So hardware-wise, I think we could be there if we wanted. The problem, I think, right now is the huge investment in fossil fuels the thumb on the scale of subsidies, the unwillingness of both industrial leaders and elected officials who, of course, want to get elected again. And if you tell the biggest 
fossil companies in your area were not interested, that's a recipe not to be elected again. So I do think that it is this tension around the social institutions, around valuing a clean economy, that are the real obstacles here going forward. And I think you, I mean, if I just take the last bit of your question about the one and a half degrees, I think you're also noticing that that graph has to go negative. Even if we convert every power plant we have today to renewables and build more, that gets us to zero. But the one, we, we've waited so long that this 1.5 degree pathway requires negative emissions. And this is an area where the views are divided. There are some people who are very strongly in favor of carbon capture at power plants, carbon capture and use, capturing the carbon and making bricks or road materials. I am not. I am not a fan of carbon capture because I actually think what it will do is exactly what you described. And that is, if we invest in carbon capture, then we will extend the life of fossil fuels. Because some groups will say, well, it doesn't matter anymore if we're burning fossil fuels if we can absorb. And all of the carbon capture projects that I'm aware of today at scale have extended the life of oil and gas fields. There is one very hopeful example in Iceland of the Orca project where they're using renewable energy and it's an example of what you described. They're using renewable energy to capture carbon from the air, direct air capture. My own personal pre preference, not that anyone has asked me, is I would like to see us investing in regrowing forests and making mangrove swamps happier and so-called nature-based solutions before we consider the industrial pathways. But my community of energy engineers and scientists are very divided. And I would say more are in favor of carbon capture than, than, than me. So I think that's the other part of what you were maybe asking. Um, I, I don't know if there are any questions I'm asked uh, to, to close the, the, this, uh, <laughs> this conference. Uh, so, um, well, I'd like to thank you really very much. Oh, thank you. I think it's a kind of conference that opened up questions more than uh, just provided answers, no? raised issues, and I think this is very stimulating for the academic community, for researchers. So uh, I leave with the feeling that we have a lot to do, we have uh, a lot to improve, uh, improve both in doing things and communicating our, our research. So uh, I thank you very much for uh, coming here to Trieste and, and giving us this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you again to Professor Kamen. And uh, thank you to all of you, also from the Giacomo Chamichan Center. Eh, ci vediamo alla prossima occasione con gli eventi del centro. Grazie. Buona serata.